Wonderful. Good morning. Welcome to another Zoom service hosted by Broadway First Baptist. Now, I'm trying to watch this meeting on my phone, so I can only see one person at a time. So I am praying that there's more than just the two of us watching this and taking part in this. I'm coming to you live at 790 Honeyman. As you notice, I'm in the sanctuary, and it seems a little weird not having anybody, but it's here. But I do know that wherever you are, we are together, and God is with us, and God is speaking to us, and God is sharing in our friendship, in our relationship, and God is doing amazing things, even though we are talking through a I don't know, for me, it's a phone or a computer or technology. God is still working, and it's just a blessing to see this. I have, I guess, only two announcements, and the one is for connection. That is due today, I do believe. And if you do have an article to give to Susan, um, send it to bfbc.news at gmail.com. And get those articles in as soon as possible, hopefully before midnight. I'm assuming Susan would like to have some rest tonight. And of course, on a sadder note, um, I haven't received any update on John's mom. I know we do know that she's not doing well, and that's all we know at this time. So we do want to pray for John, and I know Hank's going to be praying later, and we would definitely keep him and his family in our prayers. So here we are on another Sunday. You know, as John would say, um, we have a little church in the prairie gathering together to share in fellowship, to share as a family, to share God's love. And I do pray that our hearts would be open because I know God wants to speak to us in some way. And so as we hear the scriptures being read, as we hear music, as we hear Hank preach, may our hearts be open to what God has to tell us. And may we really be attentive. Shall we pray? Father God, I thank you for this day that you have given us. I thank you for my church family and wherever we are throughout the city or throughout the province or wherever we are, even on the other side of Canada, that you would speak to our hearts, Father. Now we come to worship you, we come to seek you, we come to get to know you better. And we don't come because we are trying to seek some sort of blessing from you and we come because you are worthy of our worship. So Father, I do pray that our hearts, our ears, our minds will be open. And may you be glorified and we do pray that you Holy Spirit would come in the name of Jesus, amen. The scripture reading this morning is uh, taken from the second chapter of Philippians, uh, reading the first 11 verses. I'm reading from the Revised English Bible. If then our common life in Christ yields anything to stir the heart, any consolation of love, any participation of the Spirit, any warmth of affection, or compassion. Fill up my cup of happiness by thinking and feeling alike with the same love for one another and a common attitude of mind. Leave no room for selfish ambition and vanity, but humbly reckon others better than yourselves. Look to each other's interests and not merely to your own. Take to heart among yourselves what you find in Christ Jesus. He was in the form of God, yet he laid no claim to equality with God. 
but made himself nothing, assuming the form of a slave. Bearing the human likeness, sharing the human lot, he humbled himself and was obedient even to the point of death, death on a cross. Therefore God raised him to the heights and bestowed on him the name above all names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven, on earth, and in the depths, and every tongue acclaim, Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Okay. Good morning, everyone. I see the recording button is up there. It's a, it's a phrase heard often in Christian circles, love your neighbor. Well, what does that actually mean? In my 40 plus years of being a Christian, I have discovered that the phrase can mean very different things to different people. Years ago, while a chaplain at Stony Mountain, I was asked to faci facilitate a service for an evangelist from a well-known American ministry. Now, he came highly recommended by a couple of other chaplains and had been all over the United States and Africa speaking in prisons. With some trepidation, my past experiences with evangelists had not been the best, I reluctantly agreed. Uh, my apprehension proved to be prophetic. The evangelist got up to speak, and what followed is a scene that sealed the fate of any future evangelistic requests I received while a prison chaplain. Thrusting his fists into the air as if striking out at some unknown assailant, shouting at the top of his lungs, Later, I heard a complaint from the medical wing of the prison, which is right beside the chapel. That's how loud he was. Face turning red, eyes filled with rage, twisting and turning, he demanded that the men make a commitment of faith. For 20 minutes, this display of rage went on. I was stunned, the men were stunned, and uh, no one came forward. The following day, one of the men who had been at the service dropped by the chapel to speak with me. Don had spent over 20 years in and out of prison. He had seen or been part of just about anything you can imagine going on in prison, fights, stabbings, riots. His youth was filled with the chaos of physical and sexual abuse. Drugs were his escape. And as he sat in my office reflecting on the experience of the prior night, Don spoke words that have hung with me ever since. He said, you know, I came here last night, Hank, because I like to sit in the chapel, a place where I like to come and feel safe. And you know, last night I felt like I was just being verbally abused. Now, Don and I had a good relationship, one that encompassed more than a few journeys into the deep waters of his troubled life. And he was disappointed that I had allowed this evangelist to be there. And he was right. I should have known better. At the very least, I should have shut him down. For Dawn and no doubt a few of the other men in the chapel, probably many of them, what they saw and heard were echoes of the violent abuse they had endured as children from adults who yelled and screamed and beat them out of the same rage that they saw displayed in the chapel. I apologize. Now here's an interesting twist to think about this experience. If you would have gone to speak with the evangelist after he had come to our prison, I am sure that he would have told you that he spoke out of love for the men who were there. But did he? At times, this concept of loving your neighbor can be confusing and complex. And sorting through what loving your neighbor really looks like requires a dive into a beautiful passage of scripture found in Philippians chapter 2 that Bob has read for us. Here we find some basic guidelines for practicing real love. In verses 1 to 2, Paul begins the chapter with a call to the church in Philippi to model its interactions with themselves and the world around them by being like-minded, having the same love as our Lord Jesus Christ. Then in verse 3, he begins to provide practical ways to live this out. The first of which is, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Now, we may think that's easy to do, but again, experience has shown me that it can be very tough to face that reality in our lives. 
They were a, a very faithful group of volunteers from a rural community who attended prison chapel ser services just about every month. And we had gathered together for a few minutes before the men were to come down for service. And there was a usual conversation. Then one of the volunteers voiced a view on prisons that hit a bit of a sensitive nerve with me. He said, you know, the problem with our prisons in Canada is that they're just not tough enough. We need to make these places really hard to live in. They're not tough enough. That's why people keep coming back. Well, I quickly shot back. So tell me, what happens when you put a dog in a cage and then you beat it with a stick every day? Mm -hmm. The group was shocked at my abrupt response. They were all from farming backgrounds and knew the answer to my question. None of them voiced it. I continued to get one of two things, a dog who runs from human contact or a dog who given the chance will attack you. Do you think it's any different for human beings? No one responded. They heard the tone of frustration in my voice. What they didn't know was that earlier that week, I'd spent an hour with a young man who was being forced to pay rent on his range by one of the gangs. The first time he refused, it was met with a physical beating that left numerous visible bruises. They also didn't see the face of another young man who stopped by the chapel in profound distress as he wrestled with losing his grandmother while stuck in prison. She was the only stable person in his life marred by abuse and abandonment. And added to these encounters, the volunteers did not know about the suicide that had occurred two weeks earlier. Another young man so harassed and bullied on his range that he couldn't face it anymore and took his own life with a homemade rope. That evening, as I left the prison, I wondered what motivated them to come in. Did they feel good about going and ministering to men in prison? Did it make them feel a bit more superior, a little less sinful? And that was not the first time I encountered volunteers whose motivation was clouded with a view that others were lower than them and they could be treated as such. We can all fall into that trap. Loving your neighbor begins with understanding that we are all capable of harboring self ambition and vain conceit. Paul builds on this need to pay attention to our potential for selfish ambition and conceit by reminding us at the end of verse three, but in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Now, this is a difficult verse and has no doubt presented struggles for some. It almost appears as if Paul is telling us to look down on ourselves as we look at others. That view is a, a long way from what Paul intended. And let me try and explain. So, I really enjoy carpentry. I love to build, I love to fix. Uh, I, I love a challenge when it comes to building and fixing something. And as a result, I have lots of tools. And if any of you have done carpentry or been around carpenters, you'll know that for most of them, their personal tools are pretty important. Well, I have a few tools that are really personally important to me. One set is the hammers that I use. I used to own a really nice 16 ounce finish hammer with a hickory handle. I had that hammer for years. It was my go-to on many projects. Tools have a way of wearing on you. They start to fit just right in your hand. And that was my 16 ounce hammer. Well, as a few of you might know, also know, tools and teenagers can be a challenging mix. Isaac, our son, borrowed a couple of tools for projects and promptly lost them. And one day he borrowed my beloved 16 ounce hammer. It never showed up again. He lost it. Oh, I was upset. It was a bit like losing a precious heirloom to me. I let him know in no uncertain terms that I was upset. Well, a couple of weeks passed and then a hammer showed up in my toolbox. It wasn't a nice 16 ounce hammer, but a small little eight ounce hammer that was pretty useless for a good hard hit on a nail or anything else. I was angry all over again. I was about to say something to him when he texted me, hey dad, I got you another hammer, sorry. It still wasn't my 16 ounce hammer and under my breath I grumbled away that now all I had was this useless little eight ounce toy hammer. 
The years passed and one day as I pulled that little toy hammer out, of, out for another small job, I suddenly realized something. I had used that little hammer for a multitude of small finished carpentry jobs where the 16 ounce would not have worked. In that moment, I realized that my heart was anything but humble. It was filled with a self-righteous indignation and I had completely been blind to a son trying to make very hard to make it right with his dad. So I've renamed my hammer, my little toy hammer. I now call it my humble hammer. When Paul says, consider others better than yourselves, he is challenging us to see our weakness and to be honest about those weaknesses with ourselves and before God. He's not telling us to put ourselves down, but to recognize that we are prone to being far less humble than we should be before our maker and others. Nowadays, every time I pick up that hammer to use it, my humble hammer, it reminds me that I too need to walk through this world with more humility than I do sometimes. As one commentator on this passage put it, humility here in this passage is about a proper estimation of oneself. When we look at ourselves with a proper estimation, it enables us to reach out and love others in a far more genuine way. As we come to verse four, Paul urges us to do one more other thing if we want to really love others. Less navel gazing when it comes to how we interact with the world around us. He states, each of you should look not on your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And what's interesting about this passage of scripture is that it could be termed a, a proactive approach to the needs of others. The Greek word translated as look can be translated as observe, contemplate, fix one's eyes on, or direct one's attention to. I, I really like the way Eugene Peterson translates this passage in the message. He says, forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Now, there are many examples of this in our modern world. Christian organizations such as World Vision, Mercy Ships, or our local food banks and shelters all took shape and keep moving forward because people forget themselves long enough to lend a helping hand. It is here, though, that I would like to offer a word of caution regarding what the Apostle is driving at, the Apostle Paul is driving at. It's easy for us to interpret this passage of Scripture as all about our actions, but it's about a great deal more. It's about our whole orientation to life in both the big things and the small things. Let me leave you with an example. Many years ago, I met two people who exemplified these words of scripture. Linda, my wife's mother and father. Linda's family was far from well-to-do. Her parents had managed to forge a living on a quarter section of land outside of Miami, Manitoba, raising nine children in this very tiny little house. From the very beginning, as I got to know them, there was something different about them. There was a quiet humility in their lives and faith I had not run into very often. One of the more moving moments in my connection with, with them was when Linda and I moved back to Manitoba so I could attend seminary. They offered us a small bunkhouse on the property to stay on while we figured out our housing situation in Manitoba. It wasn't much, but we were thankful for a place to stay. To our surprise, when we arrived, they had lovingly repainted it, hung curtains, fixed it up so that we would have a comfortable place to stay. It was clear that lots of hours had been spent getting it ready. They had said nothing. They had just done it, and they expected nothing from us. This capacity to forget themselves long enough to lend a helping hand permeated their lives. They were constantly reaching out and helping those around them. I remember specifically one trip they made to Halifax when we were there, when I was studying there and 
who were living there. They stayed for a little while to visit and then returned home. And after they left, Linda discovered some cash that they had left in the kitchen cupboard. This happened on more than one occasion as we struggled with the reality of making ends meet while I went to school. It was done quietly, no fanfare. They saw a need and simply forgot themselves to help out. After dad died and mom was on her own, we continued to have regular family gatherings at Easter, Christmas, and birthdays. You know, Mennonites don't need much of an excuse to gather, and they're a bit like Filipinos, actually. It was clear that as mom aged, the baking for such large events was getting more difficult. But despite the struggles she experienced from time to time, there was always her homemade cinnamon buns specifically made for the brother-in-law. A very small thing in the eyes of some, but for me, it was a regular reminder that I belong, that I had a place in her heart. And considering where I had come from in life, that was huge to me. Mom passed away a few years ago, and although we all miss her greatly, there is a legacy both her and dad left for future generations. They never strive for riches or glory. Their life exemplified Verse four, each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. In so doing, they left a model of what life looks like when you allow your life to be focused on caring for others. And in so doing, express the kind of love God desires that we all live out. Love your neighbor. It, it seems like such a straightforward action to carry out. Actually, it's not. It can be one of the most difficult commands we are called to do as Christians, and, and not because of other people, but because it starts deep within our own lives. There is within each of us. We need to carefully examine our motivations, shape a proper estimation of who we are before God and others, and form a capacity to forget ourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. One person captured all this well when they said, love begins when someone else's needs are more important than my own. These words capture in a snapshot the model gives us, Paul gives us to follow for loving our neighbor. He continues on in verses 5 to 11. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself to become obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let's... Uh, just uh, let's bow for a few moments of the prayer. Father, as we uh, are gathered here this morning on this uh, Zoom worship service, as we reflect on the beauty and the wonder of your word and uh, the incredible opportunity that we have to love our neighbor. Father, we ask that you would continue to just move and to work in each of our hearts that we might do that in a very real way to those around us. May we remember, Lord, that it's not always the big things, that it's the small things, the simple things. Those are the things that can impact people's lives so dramatically when we don't even see it. We thank you, Father, for the people that have gone before us, the, the, really the saints, Lord, that have walked ahead of us, who have modeled for us what it is to love our neighbor, to care for those around us. 
We thank you, Father, for the people that have loved us, that have cared for us along the path and along the way, who have encouraged and strengthened us. And so today we want to remember that we too have a calling in our lives to love those around us. And now through prayer, lifting them to you, we think of John and his, especially his mother, as she is struggling right now. Father, we remember the family and we lift them into your care and we ask that you administer in their lives, that you draw them close to you. Oh Lord, as we think of others in the congregation who are wrestling with personal difficulties and problems, uh, as we continue to kind of plod on through this uh, COVID-19, I ask that you would help us to encourage them and that you would strengthen those who are struggling and in need, especially those who are who are wrestling with loneliness. Father, you know that this can be just so isolating sometimes, and we ask that you would be with them and minister in their lives. We think of our world and all that is going on within it. We remember our leaders in this country as they wrestle with all the many problems and difficulties that they face. We ask that you grant them wisdom and direction in the days ahead. Uh, as we begin to see our summer come to a close and we look at the fall and what may potentially lay ahead, we ask, oh Lord, that you would just guide and direct them and lead them. And above all, Lord, we pray for your church and the world around us that is struggling in places in South America and other places with all the implications of COVID-19 COVID there. And may you help them to love their neighbor, to care for them. We thank you and we praise you for this day and all that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen.